How do you build a high-performing culture? This is Culture Architects, candid conversations with extraordinary leaders sharing their biggest successes, failures, and lessons learned on their culture journeys. Here's David J. Friedman. My guest this week is Kevin Oakes, and Kevin is the CEO and co-founder of the Institute for Corporate Productivity. He's also the author of a, a great book called Culture Renovation, 18 Leadership Actions to Build an Unshakable Company. Kevin has made it his mission to study and measure the role that culture plays in organizational success. So Kevin, welcome to the show. I'm thrilled to have you joining me. Thanks, David. Thrilled to be here. So you have spent most of your life really in this whole human capital field. And I'm curious about just like the beginning. How did you get into that? Did you decide I really want to be in human capital or did you stumble into this? <laughs> Give me a little bit of that background. Yeah, I think like a lot of people, I probably got into it by accident, David. I was working at an insurance company uh, very early in my career and woke up one morning and said, I don't want to be in insurance the rest of my life. <laughs> so I started I share that, that story, by the way. I was in insurance too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So I started um, thinking about uh, different businesses to get into. And uh, very fortunately for me, my father was also had just uh, retired from his corporate job and mm -hmm. we started looking at you know different businesses to get into and and or, and or start and we stumbled across a company that was doing interactive laser disc this was before the cd-rom was even invented mm -hmm. wow and they were creating training programs based on the la the laser disc and i fell in love with the concept of non-linear and asynchronous uh, education i had done some mm -hmm. training at the insurance company and so we started repping the products and services of this company and pretty soon the CD-ROM came around and we transitioned to that and then transitioned to the web. And uh, we, before I knew it, we had bootstrapped one of the largest custom e-learning companies uh, in the United States. And that's really how I got started in the whole human capital field. I eventually merged that company with the first company Paul Allen founded after Microsoft, a company called click to learn uh, which we IPO'd together in the late 90s. And uh, oh. so I, I was well on my way to my uh, human capital career at that time. Fascinating. And so somewhere in there, you decided or discovered or realized that within the whole world of human capital, that culture was this really important element. So what is it that caused you to wake up to that and say, hey, culture really matters here? Well, the company that I uh, that I started and run today, the Institute for Corporate Productivity, mm -hmm. we, we shortened that to I4CP, is a, a research-based organization. And we have always been fascinated by the impact that culture has on organizations and particularly on bottom line business impact. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, looked at doing several different research studies and as we studied culture, we recognized that most companies who try to change their culture uh, fail at it. In fact, only about 15% succeed at changing their culture. And I and a number of my research analysts became fascinated with uh, that statistic and, and that aspect because we wanted to really understand what were those 15% doing that mm -hmm. caused them to have success where the other 85% failed. And our initial research study um, looked at thousands of organizations across the world and uncovered commonalities between those companies who succeeded. Mm -hmm. And that was really what got me started on this whole concept of culture renovation uh, and just how powerful having a, a, a great culture can be to an organization. So when you go back, let's just talk about that research study because I'm fascinated with this. and you looked at you said 15 percent of people are successful at this and 85 percent are not so how did you in your research study define this company was successful what does successful mean in yeah. transforming renovating their culture yeah success can be very gray in this area uh it was really in the opinion of the people we were um surveying whether it was a success or not okay uh, and i think there's all there's all levels of failure and success when you're talking about culture change but we, uh, as, a, as a company, we research the people practices of high performance organizations. And so we're constantly linking the people programs of companies to the financial performance of that organization and specifically people practices that seem to impact that bottom line. 
Now, when we say high performance, we mean companies that have better revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction mm -hmm. uh, than their competition over a five-year time horizon. We try to look at it over that time horizon because things change that quickly. You know, if you go back and read uh, Good to Great, you know, a lot of those <laughs> companies aren't great anymore yes. or even <laughs> yes. around anymore. And so we, um, you know, we as a research team have always been fascinated with how HR practices can really have an impact on an organization, but particularly culture. Uh, there's no getting around the fact that culture has an enormous uh, impact on any company's financial performance. To me, that's always been intuitively obvious. And, and to most of the people I speak to, it's pretty obvious. And yet, sometimes it's really hard to measure. You know, you're a research kind of guy, and much more so than I am. I'm more of an intuitive. And I guess the question I would ask is, when you're doing that kind of research, we know, again, intuitively that it has to have a big impact. How do you put measure to that or quantify that given that you can't isolate the variables. In other words, if they, over a five-year period that you're describing, were more successful than their peer groups, there may have been many different things that contributed to that, culture being one of those. How can you substantiate that, that the impact of culture when all the other variables are changing? Yeah, you can say that for a lot of things, David. Mm -hmm. and I, I, it always frustrates me a little bit when uh, I think folks try to throw in all kinds of different variables to say mm -hmm. that was the impact it had. You know, mm -hmm. clearly when a company has financial success, there are other, uh, other things at work here. There's uh, market conditions, acquisitions they've done, their execution of products and services. Mm -hmm. But at, very early in the book, I profile Microsoft. And I, I, I love the Microsoft culture story because I think it's a story that any company can learn from, large or small, in technology or not. And what Satya Nadella and the team did uh, since 2014, when he was first named CEO of the company, is nothing short of remarkable. And if you look at the financial performance of Microsoft over that time, sure, you mm -hmm. can say that <clears throat> the market really was responsible for it uh, or, you know, just their, their great execution or even some acquisitions they've done was responsible for what he turned into the, the top or second most valuable company in the world. But when you talk to people at Microsoft, they will tell you probably one of the biggest changes for us was our culture. Hmm. We made a very concerted effort to get rid of some things that were making our culture unhealthy previously to have a very healthy culture, really um, highlighted by the concept of growth mindset, which we can talk about in a bit. Mm -hmm. And that more than anything is what has made Microsoft such a fantastic company today. And that, that same story is true across the board for many organizations that we've studied. Uh, it's very clear that if you get the culture right, the financial performance will follow. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that uh, the opposite can't happen. You come up with a great product and you have great financial success and magically the culture you know, turns into a great culture. Uh, that's possible. It's very unlikely <laughs> and the much easier mm -hmm. path is to fix the culture first and the financial mm -hmm. performance will, uh, will follow suit. You know, it's interesting. I was uh, having a conversation recently with Horst Schultze, who was the founder and CEO of Ritz Carlton. And obviously, they're known for extraordinary company, extraordinary culture. And he was lamenting the fact uh, Horst is like 83 or 84 years old. He's no longer there. But he was lamenting the fact that he talks to these, he calls them the MBA students. They come out of MBA school and they think they know what they're talking about. Because, you know, when you're in the 80s, everybody's younger and they don't know what they're talking about. But his point is that he gets frustrated when these people who are numbers people want to cut the corners on how to develop a great culture. And his point of view and experience was much as you're describing or articulating that if we take care of our customers and we take care of our people and we have a great culture, the financial performance will follow. Trying to lead with the financial performance in his personal experience is a, not a good formula and very much as you're describing it. Yeah, it's tough. You know, when you're a young company, if you're venture backed or, you know, even if you're a PE owned company, there's tremendous pressure as the CEO uh, to have financial performance. That's the mm -hmm. ultimate scorecard and whether you're going to succeed or fail. And then later when you're running a public company, it's the same thing. You've got quarterly earnings to meet and you've got, you know, investor analysts expectations and 
you know, the, the, the financial performance, uh, you know, really dominates your life when you're a leader of any organization for the most part. And so it takes uh, truly great leaders to recognize, in my opinion, that I've got to get this culture right as we continue to perform financially. And that will be the, the biggest boon I can have to my financial performance. Yes. And I love, I love the Ritz story. I think I even talked about Ritz in the book briefly. Um, I've been involved um, in some of their, their morning sessions that they're famous they for. Lineup, yeah. Yeah, the lineup. And, um, you know, and I just think they, they created a lot of things that um, other companies have emulated. In fact, I even um, emulate in our company one, one uh, Ritz uh, rule that they put in place. And you can feel it. You can just feel it when you're in those companies that have a great culture. And yes. early in the book, I talk about that. I, I talk about a, uh, you know, a story where back in 2009, I had meetings with two iconic technology companies. And I don't reveal the names of the companies mm -hmm. uh, in the story until the end where I describe the, the completely opposite feelings from the culture in the meetings that I had with those organizations. And the poor culture was HP, and you know mm -hmm. we know the struggles that they've had, and the great culture was Apple. Mm -hmm. um, and for years I've been showing, here's what would have happened had I trusted my gut and invested in, in each one of those companies <laughs> at that point in time, uh -huh. right? You really wish I had done the Apple one. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a, a stark contrast. And, yes. you know, I just I have the benefit of going into a lot of organizations on a regular basis. And you really can sense uh, many times from organizations whether they have a healthy culture or not. Yeah. So for the sake of our audience, I mean, here we are, we're talking about how important culture is and the impact the culture has and, and the impact it's going to have on the bottom line. But we haven't really defined it. So. I'm sure you get asked this all the time. What's your definition of culture? What is it that we're talking about? Well, I'm, I might be the only person who's written a book on culture and purposely did not define it in okay. the book. Uh, because <laughs> right. I, people love coming up with cute little sayings and, and quotes around what culture is. So, you know, there, there are many, and I think we all know what culture is, but, you know, some that, that people have used is culture is felt by people because of what is done or condoned or rewarded or encouraged or even penalized. Mm -hmm. um, others have said, you know, culture is the way you think, act, and interact inside an organization. Uh, Herb Kelleher, the founder of Southwest Airlines, he said, culture is what people do when no one is looking, mm -hmm. right? So we had, for our original study, we had a, a much more academic um, uh, definition that talked about the shared values and beliefs inside the organization mm -hmm. and provided them for behavioral guidelines, you know, so all of those are accurate. All of those are definitions of culture. Uh, but for some reason, people love to get really cute with their definition of culture and think they've come up with something really original. And that's why I didn't, <laughs> uh, I just didn't even try to define it because, you know, most people know what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I, I hear you on that from my own personal perspective. I do think outside of cute that it's hard to, for us to talk about how to improve a culture, how to renovate a culture, how to build a great culture, if we all have different ideas of what that actually means. I mean, some people, when they talk about culture, I know you and I aren't thinking this, but some people, what they're visualizing is we have pizza every Friday and we have a ping pong table in the reception area and we play foosball all the time and they call that culture, which clearly is not what we're talking about. So I do think there's some value in being able to at least put a little more clarity for the conversation with people so that two people are saying the same thing. To me, I think of culture very much from a behavioral perspective. You know, I, I'm focused on what are the behaviors that are actually happening in the company, regardless of where they come from or how they got developed or anything else. At the end of the day, what people actually do is more the culture than anything else. Yeah. And that's one of my early steps in um, building a successful culture is defining the desired behaviors. Mm -hmm. And later we talk about having leaders walk the talk and, and uh, being trained on those desired behaviors so that those are manifested throughout the organization. You know, I just think that a lot of people really do. They don't think of culture as the ping pong table necessarily. You know, that's uh, one little right. aspect of a lot of cultures. And certainly the pandemic has changed the viewpoint of culture. I've been very frustrated with some CEOs who have said our office is our culture um, and we're going to lose our culture if we don't get back mm -hmm. to the office. And uh, 
it, it's interesting that a lot of CEOs are now walking back those statements. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just just the other day, the um, you know one one financial CEO that I won't name just said uh, I was I was mistaken. I shouldn't have mm -hmm. forced people to come back to the office and. You know, our culture is much more than that. And so I think we're I think it's it's healthy right now that there's a lot of CEOs that are recognizing um, that the office is not what the company is all about. Right. That, uh, it's, it's much bigger than that. It, it sounds like, Kevin, that most of your research has been with and correct me if I'm wrong about this with fairly, I would call them large companies. Is that true? No, we um, we survey and study um, a wide variety of companies, okay. um, uh, companies that are under 100 people to okay. the largest companies in the world. Uh, there's a total of um, 30 to 40,000 companies globally wow. that are part of our, our research panel. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're doing more HR research than just about anyone on the planet, looking at the people practices of all of those organizations. Now, when we publish studies, we will typically uh, provide stats based on size. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will very clearly articulate these stats are for companies that are under a thousand employees, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, here are what companies that had more than 20,000 employees uh, had to say about this particular topic. And mm -hmm. then we'll also do it by geographic region, um, you know, by Europe, by Asia, or we'll get into specific countries and try to contrast sometimes how different regions and countries uh, look at a particular issue. And so, so let, let's break that down a little bit or un unpack that. In your observation, the, the results of your, your research at least, what things, if any, are different about, let's say, companies that are under 100 people versus larger companies in terms of how culture happens in those companies? It's pretty different when you're talking about a hundred person company versus a hundred thousand person company. Mm -hmm. You know, as a hundred person company, the CEO probably knows everybody in the company, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's about the the uh, you know the the cutoff when you start not knowing everybody in the company mm -hmm. about a hundred people. And as a as a small company, uh, you can control the narrative a little bit better. You can um, you know you can have that message uh, come directly. Um, mm -hmm. from that, from the leaders inside the organization. Um, but I counsel those small companies all the time. Don't ignore culture. This is something that you want to set right from the beginning. If you're a growing company, you want to make sure that you're setting up the company to have a very healthy culture long term as you grow. Because as you scale and as you start to not know everybody as a CEO, uh, you've got to rely on th those norms. You've got to rely on some of the, the systems and processes and certainly the the people that you've put in place from a leadership perspective to carry that culture forward. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't been explicit on what you want that culture to be, then it can sometimes just morph into things that you didn't expect. A CEO or, or a leadership team of a much larger organization, the challenges are often pretty different. And, and the catalysts for changing culture are usually pretty finite. A typical catalyst would be a new CEO coming into an organization. That's probably mm -hmm. the most common. Another one would be an acquisition, um, either being acquired or acquiring another company. Oftentimes, the the impetus is just going through poor earnings, um, you know, a few quarters of, of down performance and recognizing that there are things about your culture you want to change. Uh, even others could be a scandal has happened inside the organization. <laughs> And you recognize that you've got to, you know, change some things about the culture. Those, those are the common ones. There are others, but mm -hmm. uh, what I, the reason that we started this research and the reason I wrote this book, is because you'll find a lot of articles and a lot of books on culture and the importance of culture out there. What you won't find is how to change it, yes. and that that was something I heard over and over again from various leaders as I explored culture over the years is that there's no blueprint out there. Uh, you know, I recognize how important it is, but if I want to change it, what do I do? And mm -hmm. that was what we wrote about in Culture Renovation. We came out with 18 action steps based on that research and a real blueprint that organizations can follow to change their culture. And today there are, there are many very large Fortune 100 companies who are using the book and that blueprint uh, to impact their organization today. 
That's interesting. Well, hang on, Kevin, because we have to take a break right now. But coming up in the second part of my talk with Kevin Oakes, the CEO and co-founder of the Institute for Corporate Productivity and the author of Culture Renovation, Kevin's going to share how companies should rethink the way they bring on new employees. Today, what the smart companies are doing is making onboarding all about relationships and how do we set you up with the right relationships inside the company to make you successful long term. This has been Culture Architects with David J. Friedman. Be sure to join us next time for more insights and wisdom from great leaders from all walks of life. To book David for your events or to learn more about his writing, speaking, or consulting, go to davidjfriedman.com. Culture Architects with David J. Friedman is a production of Forbes Books.